there's still going to be actually the recording for the worship will start next Wednesday so we want to see everyone here next Wednesday let's come fired up next Friday not this weekend but next weekend on Friday and Saturday Friday evening and all Saturday I'm asking each one of you to just block your schedule make sure you're here if you're working ask your boss to take a day off during that day on Saturday there'll be a lot of people here and if you're single you have another reason to be here this weekend <laughs> So I'm like, hey man, when is it again? <laughs> it's next weekend, <laughs> next Saturday. With that said, I know that we've heard quite a few good testimonies on finances from Andre and then also from Irina and others. Even on Sunday, some of you heard the testimonies about finances. We have to understand there's three levels of financial prosperity in our life. The first level is when we don't have enough. It's called not enough. It's a poverty level. The second level is when we get just enough and it's a provision level and then the third level is when we get more than enough it's the prosperity level it's when you have more than enough when Israel was in Egypt they were in poverty they did not have enough they worked really hard and Pharaoh took all of their money when God took them out of Egypt not only God protected them and just gave them deliverance but he also took made Egyptians pay for everything Israel worked for and he somehow blinded their minds that when Egypt when Israel came to Egyptians and asked them for money and for things Egyptians knew Israel's are not coming back yet they gave them money because God was paying and delivering them and bringing them into a place of just enough in the land of wilderness they had just enough of manna they had just enough of things and sometimes they complained because this level sometimes could be also painful but when they got into the promised land they've had more than enough because God said that you will be in the land flowing with milk and honey I will on purpose put giants in the promised land so they'll build big houses and eventually you will kick them out and live in big houses I will on purpose make them do big things so that you people will walk in there and live there because you will be in the place of more than enough the name for our God one of the names is Jehovah Jireh means the God who is my provider maybe you are in a place today sitting and you are in a place of not enough well you literally don't have enough money each month to make ends meet you're living from hand to mouth your credit cards are never paid off and it's not just because you constantly you know you're a shopaholic or you're curing your emotional problems with buying new toys but because you're just simply living life eating uh, getting food getting clothes paying for gas and you don't have enough money and if you think that that is God's will for you I want to tell you something it is not sometimes there's actually a devil who stands behind that and God wants us to be blessed he wants to take us from not enough to enough and maybe you are in that place today where you have just enough you don't have any extra money to save and you sure don't have any extra money to give to anybody else God wants to take you to another place where you have more than enough where you have more than enough God's name one of the God's names is El Shaddai means more than enough this is not just you getting a Mercedes and a big house this is you experiencing God I'm not talking about just that you have a degree because I know people with degrees who are broke I know people who make big income but they don't have nothing to show for and there are people who work hard who have nothing to show for and so this is about getting to know God as you get to know him as a savior or if you had a chance to get to know him as your healer that you get to know him as someone who helps you in finances and somebody who supernaturally helps you in the area of your finances God wants to do that in our life and we all are to experience God in those areas in third of John chapter 1 verse 2 Apostle Paul is praying for one of his people that he's writing to and he says the following beloved he's addressing him he said I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers Apostle Paul is praying for this Apostle John I'm sorry Apostle John is praying during his prayer and says I pray that you will prosper your life will prosper and you will be in good health according or just as your soul is prospering 
It is the will of God to prosper you. From the beginning when God made heaven and the earth, God did not create lack on this earth. In the Garden of Eden, there was no hunger, there was no thirst, and there was no problems. People who say, well, see, Jesus was always poor and he taught his people to be poor. It is true that there are people in the Bible that we see that were poor and the people who struggled and everything. But we have to, anytime we take one topic, we have to look at it not through one scripture out of a context. We have to put that in the context of the whole Bible from the beginning to the end. If it is the heart of God to help us to live in lack and from hand to mouth and not have enough to meet our needs, and not have enough to sponsor and help other people. Why does God want to impose something on you that doesn't live himself by? Why he has gold and silver on the streets? Why he owns all the silver and gold and the cattle on thousand hills but for his children? I want you to crawl under the table living in crumbs. God always says to be like him. He says, I'm merciful, be merciful. He says, I'm loving, you be loving. God wants you to be like Him. And God is not broke. God is blessed. Very generous and very blessed. You cannot be generous if you're broke. Some people have a problem with the idea of God wants you to be blessed because some people have this idea. They know if they get blessed, they will get greedy. Our goal is to be like God, to be generous as He is and to be blessed as He is. And sometimes you have to be generous first before you get blessed and sometimes you got to get blessed first before you get generous. Can somebody say amen? It's like one guy who was selling stuff in his, on a yard sale. He put this little note in the newspaper. He said, I'm selling a tape recorder, a video camera and another, another thing. All of them are working. I'm the only one who's broke. Apostle John is telling us that prosperity in life depends on the prosperity of the soul. For a moment right now I want to talk about how God wants to bring a blessing in the area of finances into our life. Prosperity in life depends on the prosperity inside of your soul. That means your mind is what attracts money into your life, not money is the one that are going to make you happy on inside. Your, our biggest need is not to get money but is to be inside a person who is wealthy and on inside a person who is prosperous. The second thing that we see out of this verse that is very important is that if you get prosperity in finances, it will not bring prosperity in your soul. In 2002, there was a 19 years old man who won $15 million lottery. Now, $15 million is not $15,000. That's a lot of money. That's probably more than some of us will make in a lifetime. 19 years of age man wins a $15 million lottery. You would think it will immediately make him, you know, to be a good person. He goes in gambling goes and spends it on drugs and then he spends it on prostitutes and about a few years later he is again a garbage man where he started. If money would solve our problems then a Cali Rogers who received three million dollars in lottery six years later became a single mom with two jobs as a maid and is living from hand to mouth. Ken Proxmer won millions of dollars years later his wife left him and he filed for bankruptcy. William Post won 16 million dollars in lottery. Within a decade he declared bankruptcy. His brother ordered a contract killing on his life. His, girlf his girlfriend dumped him and sued him and he lives on social security. Jack Wither won 315 million dollars. What you're dreaming on multiply by 10. 315 million dollars. This guy had the prosperity. Within a decade his wife divorced him, his daughter and granddaughter both died of consumption related issues. His property was broken into repeatedly. He wound up bouncing checks into casinos because he no longer had cash to cover them. 
whether you win 500 million or 1 million 70 percent of people lose or spend all of it within five to six years why because when you broke on inside no amount of money will ever fix you giving you money giving me money if I am on inside a broke person broke person means I think like a broke person I speak like a broke person and I behave like a broke person I look at people in the way that I'm inside I am just a person who is not fulfilled a person not satisfied and a person not filled with God and not filled with God's perspective no amount of money will ever fix my life actually giving me money will kill me only prosperous soul guarantees the prosperity in your life won't hurt you but it will bless you and you will use it to bless other people can somebody say amen? amen and therefore we should change our dreams from winning a lottery to getting saved getting delivered and getting our mind renewed and getting God's word inside of our mind whether you are having holes in your shoes and you don't have enough to make ends meet today that is not our biggest problem our biggest problem is between our ears and what's going on right here because if money comes our way but inside we are not prosperous very soon that money will come to the level of our inner prosperity or lack of it there was a man in the Bible and we see him in Mark chapter 10 verse 51 and verse 52 says the following and Jesus answered and said to him what do you want me to do for you the blind man said to him Rabuni that I may receive my sight then Jesus said to him go your way your faith has made you well and immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road now let me give you a quick backstory Bartimaeus was a beggar he wasn't poor he was very very poor it's one thing when we don't have enough funds to go to a movie on the weekend it's another thing when you don't have enough money to buy new rims for your car or those new shoes that are $65 or $600 purse it's it's one thing that kind of poverty but the poverty Bartimaeus was experiencing is poverty most of us don't even fathom and imagine what because of that lack of inability to see he had to actually stand on the road and not fake a sign that I need to go to Montana and I just need money or I arrived in Tres Cities and nobody met me to took me to a hotel could you just borrow me 60 bucks he actually was blind he was a beggar that's all he lived for asking people to give him money and Jesus passes by here is an opportunity to ask Jesus for a lot doesn't God help us with our needs and Jesus passes by and Bartimaeus has a decision do I ask him for money or do I ask him for something more important what would you ask Jesus knowing he could give you a check for a million dollars but Bartimaeus doesn't ask Jesus for money he said Jesus I want to see broke like a joke have never had a job I don't have a resume I never finished high school it's dangerous if I will see because I don't know where I will have to start but Jesus my biggest problem is not my begging and lack of money I don't have a vision if you give me a vision I will find a job and I will know what to do with that money your biggest need is not money it's a vision can somebody say amen Bartimaeus chooses us a lesson blindness is the cause of poverty blindness is ignorance anytime we are ignorant in the area of finances but we are educated in the level of engineering in the area of engineering we are educated in the area of being a teacher we may be educated in the area of knowing theology we may be educated in the level of knowing how to work with bricks or knowing how to fix vehicle in the area of finances if you and I are not educated by God's word and by proper good material in that area you and I are blind in the area you are ignorant in is the area you are blind in and in that area you will be 
always struggling. Bartimaeus knew, my problem is not lack of money. My problem is ignorance. I'm blind. If Jesus can give me my sight, I will no longer be a beggar. I won't become rich right away. We don't see Bartimaeus becoming wealthy in the next verse but we see in the next verse Bartimaeus stopped begging because he started to walk after Jesus. I realized that in my own personal life and you have to come to that point in your own. We need a vision. Finances first don't start with paying off your credit card, getting out of debt, not getting bad deals and not buying things you don't need. Finances first begin with this. What is the vision you have in your mind concerning God, finances and wealth? When you see a rich person, what is the thing that's screaming in the head of your mind? He's greedy. That's who you would be if you would be him. Oh, he has a nice car. That doesn't mean he's greedy. If that is the vision that wealth is evil, remember this, it will not come to us. Money is evil. Some people say, well, that's, that's what my parents taught me. It never says that in the Bible. Bible says love of money is evil. Just like love of any other things that comes before God is evil. For some people, the thing that comes constantly in their mind is fear and anxiety that things won't work out, that things will be difficult, that I will always not have enough, that I will be a school dropout, I won't have enough to pay for my college. If I graduate, there will be no jobs for me. They're cutting in my job, the, their budget was cut and I'm afraid that I will be caught. And a person who has a vision of fear, panic and constantly expecting bad things to happen in their finances, no matter how much money they have, this person inside is poor. What, what does it take to have a prosperous soul? I just want to point out three things. One of them is this. We have to move from fear to faith. Prosperous soul is the one that on inside has faith when it comes to the area of money. There's only two kinds of camps that you can be in in the area of money. You can be on the side of fear and fear is the door through which Satan will attract exactly the same things we are afraid of. Or we can be on the side of faith where we are standing on God's promises and we are expecting that no matter how bad the economy is, no matter how horrible your boss is, or no matter how challenging is your workplace is, that God is able to still see you through. You will not die, that you will not go broke or bankrupt, that everything will work out for you. This faith attracts good things into your life. Fear is something that is a constant thoughts ringing in your mind concerning money. A panic, an anxiety that you won't have enough. Nothing bad is happening but you are expecting it. And that is a magnet that draws poverty into your life and it opens a back door for all the demons of distraction to come in. And usually people who are afraid always blaming someone. Always it's somebody else's fault. Always it's somebody and they're usually full of self-pity. You can be a person who is pitiful or powerful, but you can't be both at the same time. <laughs> or we can switch to be a people of faith. I love the Psalm 23. It's one of my favorite Psalms. Almost every other day I pray through this Psalm in my prayer time. It helps me to have something to pray for, uh, to pray through because otherwise my mind goes all around. And so when I would pray through this psalm, it brings me so much encouragement. And one of the things in this psalm says, in verse 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. Means I'll have just enough. And then it goes to a few other verses and it goes to the next verse where it says, When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. So you're just going from a place where you have just enough money and you just have some bumps on your road. Because if you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, that is some bumps. But what I love David for is he says this, even when I am in a tough time financially, I am afraid of no evil. It means I have faith. 
I don't know what tomorrow holds for me but I know someone who holds that tomorrow and he stands next to me right now. He says for you are with me. Your rod and your staff they comfort me. You know the amazing this after this verse we see David says next he says you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. David just went from having just enough, went through some really challenging time in the area of his finances but he said even when things are hard I am not gonna panic, I am not gonna afraid, I am not gonna stop giving, I'm gonna still trust God and God brings him out to a place where his cup runs over. Maybe you are here today and you are in exactly the same situation. I want to give you something to hold on to. When you are in a time that is hard financially, things that are difficult and it seems like you can't keep going. Before you get to the my cup runs over you have to get this part. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my... What is your enemy? Is it fear that he won't make it? Is it unemployment? Is it debt? Is it collections? Is it you're not able to make payments on certain things? Whatever your enemy is, what God is saying is this. God will prepare a table for you. Make sure you take a seat and you eat, not your enemy. What happens to most of us when we go through difficult time, we feed our fears. We feed our feelings instead of feeding our faith. God prepares a table every Wednesday, every Sunday, every home group. The only problem, nobody shows up at the table to eat. God prepares a message. God prepares a revelation. God puts those things at the table and he says for you to cross from your valley to the overflow you have to sit down at the table. Let the devil laugh. Let your fears scream and yell and you say keep talking. I'm gonna keep on eating. I am gonna feed my faith not feed my fears. I won't feed what I feel. I will feed what I believe. I will not feed my doubts. I will feed my faith. My doubts will be there knocking at the door but I will open the Bible and keep reciting the scriptures, keep saying those scriptures, keep thinking those scriptures and doing whatever it takes so that I eat and let the enemy watch. Can somebody say amen? amen. God takes us from a place of lack to just enough. And then from just enough to having more than enough, when we recognize that having faith and having our mind being soaked with positive expectations that we will not go under but we will go above. That is the key of this. There was 12 spies who went into the promised land and they were about to embark on something called more than enough, the prosperity. And when they would go into it they saw all the good things that God has promised but they also saw unpleasant creatures they called them giants and instead of staying strong on the promises of God and saying you know what these giants they're big and I don't know how we are going to overcome them but God has been so good to us before I mean he kind of drowned the whole army of Egyptians in the Red Sea he plagued all of their gods with his power he provided for us and these giants are no match for our God instead of that attitude they came back to Israel with another attitude. They said, we saw the giants and we were like grasshoppers in our eyes. This is what happens. When before you enter a next level in your financial life, you will encounter problems and the, sh the balance, the change is going to be this determining factor. Will you have milk and honey mindset when things are tough? Or will you reduce your dream to a grasshopper because you just witnessed a financial setback? The interesting part is this. God promised they will take the land. Yet people who took the mindset of a grasshopper died like grasshoppers. Though God's promise was not for that. You know what's more dangerous than giants? It's a grasshopper mentality. It's when those giants come inside of us and they paralyze us and they cripple us on inside and we begin to look at our financial struggles. We begin to look at our finances with a side of fear 
expecting bad, anticipating bad things, <clears throat> anticipating bad things, and always speaking negative things. We will never have enough money. That's how we were. That's how my parents were. I hope they're not going to fire me. I hope we're going to have enough just to make it. Those kind of words, those kind of thoughts, those kind of expectations are the expectations of a grasshopper. Your promise of God says he wants to give you land flowing with milk and honey. God's promise says he delights in prosperity of his servants. We are God's children. If he delights that his servants prosper, how much more he delights his children prosper. God's word says if we do not let God's word depart from our mouth, that it will meditate in it day and night. means we will have a new image, new optimist, excitement and, ex and expecting good things. He said you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. God says he gives power to get wealth. The Bible is all surrounded with scriptures and we have to make that into the image of our mind. Otherwise, we will live on the side of fear and the fear, like faith, will always bring us to what we expect, speak and think about. The second thing that makes us a prosperous soul on inside is when we move from tipping to tithing. That means when we put God as the Lord of our finances. The challenge that we have as Christians many times is that when we begin to envision and begin to have positive view about our future, even though when things are hard, the mistake many people make where many times these promises don't work is this, is when people begin to read a lot of books about money and they begin to read a lot of, go to seminars, they're like, yeah, that's it, I'm gonna invest, I'm gonna, you know, start a business, I'm gonna do this with my finance, I'm gonna cut the plastic, the credit cards out, I'm gonna stop, you know, buying these things, I'm gonna put my money to bring me more money and they get all pumped with this new vision and new ideas. But they never make it to step, step number two. It's when you think, that putting yourself in charge of your finances will make you a prosperous person and not allowing the God who gave you the very brains which can fathom those ideas to be the first and your best partner. Many of us we accept Jesus into our heart as our Savior but we will never accept him as the Lord in the area of our finances because accepting Jesus as the Lord in the area of your finances cannot be done verbally and cannot be done with saying a prayer. It can only be done by an act of actually putting him first in your finances, not your mouth but your finances. And then God begins to be in charge of the rest of the things. Same thing happened to Bartimaeus when he got his vision the first thing that he did surprisingly he didn't go back home look for his parents or look for his brothers and sisters and say guys I can see surprisingly Bartimaeus didn't go to a library and quickly started typing his resume he didn't go and start to start write a book so he can become a bestseller and he can quickly make money the Bible says the first thing when he got his vision he didn't run after money he said I am gonna run after Jesus that means when a person gets a positive vision they have to put Jesus first in their finances and the way we do that as Christians is by this principle discipline and an act of obedience we called tithing now there's a difference between tithing and tipping I'm going to give you the difference tipping is what people do who don't put Jesus first in their finances now some are still Christian and some are still going to heaven but tipping is this it's whatever I have extra or I don't need or left over I hand it over to God that's tipping you can only do that to someone who is not the Lord of your life tithing is not extra left over I'll see at the end of the month whatever is in my wallet how I feel it tithing is this when the check comes in you go to the bank or it gets deposited 10% gets immediately pulled out without even second thoughts put into an envelope sealed and you don't even entertain one thought I wonder what I could buy with those money but you only have one thought ringing in your mind the person I'm linking up with is the maker of heaven and the earth the only reason i have a heartbeat is because he made it 
the only reason I'm able to give that because he gave me that opportunity and he is not a taker he has so much he doesn't need my money but I need his mercy and blessing on the rest of the 90 percent he's watching this he knows this I'm making a deal I'm not an idiot I'm a smart person I want to partner with the richest the wisest and most generous and I choose to partner with him that's what tithing is tithing is not tipping many people tithe at the end after they pay all their bills oops I don't have enough that's tipping I am not saying you're not a Christian but Jesus in the area of your finances is somewhere over there with Giza, Hapo and Bank of America and don't be surprised if he doesn't do anything in finances Jesus doesn't like to be bullied and pushed and thrown leftovers he does really good when he is first and Lord let me give you just a basic simple instruction about tithing it's supposed to be done first not last you don't wait until all the bills are paid for if you're a Christian and you choose to put God first in your finances you put first means the moment you receive that's how I do it I take that first I don't pay my bills I don't do anything until first that is removed to me that is sacred to me this is not just a tradition and a ritual that my father taught me that's how it was in the beginning now it's a very sacred thing when I hold my envelope and I try to hold that envelope in my hands it's completely awesome to send money through PayPal but if there is a way you can also have that tithing in your hand in this way you care you, you, you connect something with your emotions when the prayer is offered every time that the tithing or offerings are done and I have something in my hands that is when I pray most sincerely than any other time in the service well because whatever's in the envelope costs me a lot all other things don't cost me nothing when it's in the envelope as a thousand dollars I'm gonna pray sincerely <laughs> that's why I sometimes get upset I'm like why did you finish I'm like you're probably not giving anything this Wednesday I'm like I'm giving a lot give me like a 20 minute prayer I need to like concentrate and I, and I literally sometimes I would cry I would feel the presence of the Holy Spirit to me that is a deal I go into a covenant with the invisible being who makes a man who came into this country as an immigrant who half of his life struggled with insecurity and doesn't have anything than a high school diploma can lift that man and make him shine and bring blessings into his life from sources that he cannot even pull on his own that is who I am in covenant with you may be you may know Bill Gates I know someone who holds his heartbeat and I want to be in a covenant with that someone and he also holds mine and he also holds yours another thing that's very important when you begin to tithe as a Christian the first thing that will happen is the devil will give you all of these thoughts what you could do with the money in your tithing envelope you will became so creative it's interesting that when you bring money to pay for your car let's say it's three hundred dollars well, let's say you're paying a, a house payment if you live in apartments maybe eight hundred dollars you don't take those eight hundred dollars and you don't spend one thought I wonder how many coffee cups I could buy for $800 never once you think that you should because you could own an apartment complex and get those money paid to you but you don't think like that the only time we think what we could do with that money is when we can partner with the creator of universe you know what we should do we should never think about what we could do with the money when we partner with God but we should start thinking why am I paying a thousand dollars for rent when I can own the property have someone pay me a thousand dollars that's when you should use your creativity not untithing I remember when it happened to me um, it wasn't the issue of tithing but the Holy Spirit uh, placed on my heart and I just kind of made a decision last year that I'm going to increase my giving to a particular measure it was it was it was a big big number for me and um, beginning when the year started I didn't do it first month I did it more than I did it before but I didn't know exactly as I made it a decision in my heart well my excuse was I didn't have particular funds at that time so the next month I didn't do it again but this month I had two hundred dollars lacking to meet that particular goal that I wanted to give and so I gave already but two hundred dollars were lacking and this so happens one person walks into the house and says I just want to bless you it was exactly two hundred dollars 
I was like, oh, praise God. And the thought comes to my mind, how awesome. God provided you money to give him. And I was like, why would God ask me for something and then give it to me? I was like, that's not God. I'm like, God gave this for me, to bless me. So I go ahead and took that money for myself. Because I needed that money. A few days later, a, uh, one of my rentals, a sewer breaks. Now some of you know that I hate demons with the same passion as I had sewer problems. <laughs> sewer problems in all rental places are all <laughs> demonized at times. This sewer problem, I thought no big deal. I already fixed them before. I know how to do that. I went in, tried to work on it. Nothing worked. Both of the tenants on both sides could not use water and shower for whole two days. Which means I had to drop them rent next day. Next, to cut the story short, next day, I invited my father. I'm like, my dad is a genius. He will come and fix it. He comes in. We spend there. We got only smelly, dirty, but nothing was fixed. Then the third day, I hired a company. A company came in. I was like, well, the company will fix it. They spent one hour, didn't fix it. They spent second hour. And for each hour, they're clocking money. And on the third hour, I was literally standing there on my knees and begging God to save my soul. I was like, God, if they don't push through all this problem, I am going to go down with this drain. And finally, after a third hour, everything was fixed. But three days I spent in smelly, nasty environment. And not only that, my mind was so full of anxiety. And at the end, this cost me about $500. The particular, I didn't think of anything with it. I'm a person who doesn't judge myself too much unless God puts a light to certain problems in my life. Until I went to a certain prayer time and I remember that the Lord gently just placed on my heart. He said, why was it so hard to give 200 to me? But you willingly gave 500 to the stupid sewer who drained you for three days, made you smell like poop and you still paid. And that day, I'm not saying in any way that every problem happens because we don't give. But in that case, it was a test for me and I failed. I wept like a baby. I was repenting for that as though I did some horrible sin. And I promised to God, I said, Lord, if you protect me from sewers, I promise to give you. And I will never think in my mind again what I could do with it. I am going to think with what you could protect me from that I'm not aware of. The last thing about tithing is tithing does not go to somebody at Walmart asking for money for charity. Tithing does not go to the pastor. Tithing goes to the local church where you serve. Sometimes what people do with tithing is they will bring it to a person and, on the street and they just give it to them. They said, well, here's I have tithing and I just bless them with it. That is not tithing. That's called charity. Tithing goes to the local church where you serve. Some people give tithing to TBN. TBN is not your local church. Good News Church is where you serve, it's where you love God, it's where you taught the Word of God and that's where we bring, that's where I bring my tithing and that's where all of us bring our tithings for the glory of God. Can somebody say amen? To bring this message to the end, let's mention the third thing that makes a prosperous soul is we have to move from greed to generosity. From greed to generosity. Greed is what opens the door for demonic attacks in our life. Greed is very simple. We love money more than God. We, we trust in money more than God and we use dubious ways to make more of money. Greed is not having a lot of money. Greed is when money has you. And the problem with greed is that greed opens the door for the devil and greed allows Satan to come and attack our finances and because we begin to do things with our money that are wrong and evil and they hurt other people. And generosity on the other hand opens the way for God to bless us and to use us for his glory. A few years ago I had a very interesting incident that happened to me. There was this investment opportunity that was presented and I went to the, my bank and withdrew, uh, it was a thousand dollars to put into this investment opportunity. And on a side note, don't ever invest into anything you don't understand. And secondly, don't ever invest into something with money borrowed from someone else. Only invest the money you're willing to lose and not cry about it. Because that's most likely half of the investments will be. So I took the $1,000 and it was a cashier's check and put this in, everything was great. And I noticed on my account, $1,000 were not removed. I'm not very knowledgeable. I wasn't very knowledgeable in these things. I thought it's gonna take a month for the money to disappear from my account. After a month, I noticed the money was still there and secretly I was hoping they will stay there. 
I approached my father and I said, Father, was that supposed to be like that? That the money is supposed to stay there after a cashier's check? He's like, well, if it's a cashier's check, they would draw the money right away. I'm like, well, praise God. The money are going to stay in my account. And so I secretly started to praise God for an extra thousand dollars that the lady, the bank teller, made a mistake on me. But you know, I'm a preacher, I'm a Christian. After a while, my consciousness started to dawn on me that this is not right. I need to go to the bank and tell them that they made a mistake. The other voice in my head said, well, it's their mistake, not yours. And God is blessing you. But I know God wasn't blessing me. God was testing me. I go to the bank and I said, hey, this is not a big deal, but it was a thousand dollars. I just wanted to check why they were not removed from my account. The managers got together. They come approach me and they said, did you know that when you took that, withdrew that money, there was a lady who did all of the procedure. I'm like, I actually remember her. She was so nice. It was an elderly lady. He, she said, we gave her three days to find who she took that thousand dollars from. And she couldn't remember who she did it from. We fired her. I was like, you fired her because she made that mistake? And something in me just clicked. If I would have went to the bank in three days and been honest with them, this elderly lady, a sweet lady, would have never been fired. Now, it was her mistake, you might say. But also, I am not off the grid if I have not been honest. I repented. They took the money away. I was like, well, can you hire the lady back? They're like, nope. I was like, okay, they keep the money in my account. <laughs> they took the money and the lady was fired. But I've learned something that day that was very important. Is this. Anytime you are not honest completely, anytime you steal from someone, somebody is going to suffer. And God will not allow you to go unpunished. What he will do, he won't punish you. He will lift his protection and then the enemy will take a move and attack. There was a guy in the Bible named Judas. He was, if you can stand up, he was so close to Jesus physically like I am to Nazareth. For three and a half years, he was always around Jesus physically. He actually happened to be Jesus' treasurer. That means that he was the guy that people brought the money. He would count them, put in the treasury. With one hand, he would put the money in. With another hand, he would take the money out and buy shoes. Because, well, since following Jesus requires a lot of walking and Jesus doesn't pay for shoes, I'm just going to take from the treasury and buy myself some shoes. And Jesus, who knows everything, can read people's thoughts, never mentioned anything to Judas about stealing from his own ministry. So Judas thought Jesus is okay with it. He kept taking more, taking more, taking more. And after a while, he thought it was completely normal to steal from Jesus because Jesus doesn't say anything. And because he doesn't say anything, that means my conscience is clear. And he was stealing more, stealing more, stealing more until one day, Judas stumbled upon this crazy creative idea to set Jesus up to be captured by people who don't like him and make money in the way. Where did that idea come from? Repeated stealing brought him to an idea that was so out of this world. He could have not done it. But because he was stealing and he was reflecting the nature of Satan, he was sitting with Jesus on the Last Supper. A disciple with Jesus but stealing secretly, being dishonest secretly and has this crazy idea to do one more move that will make him so wealthy. And in that moment being with Jesus close, Satan the Bible says walks into Judah inside. Did you know that when you continuously steal and are dishonest, you can actually get demon possessed? You may say, how? The very nature of Satan is a thief. When you steal and you don't repent, after a while, not only you are acting like him, you actually inviting him inside of your life. There was a person in the Bible who was dishonest about money and got a leprosy. There are people who lie about their finances. They don't recognize that just because you tied does not give you a right to cut corners, lie and being dishonest. Somebody is being hurt and that somebody will cry out to God and we will be in trouble. I remember hearing a testimony of one, one lady in Ukraine who had an incurable sickness. And she was sitting in the church asking God to heal her. God, heal me, heal me. And during the prayer, uh, the Holy Spirit paints a picture to her that when she was working in this particular hospital, there was 150 Ukrainian money that was laying there and she took it and hid it. 
the lady whose money it was start looking around for that money and says anybody who took that money please just put it back secretly I have children to feed and if I don't have that money I can't eat my children won't eat please I won't judge you I won't call the police but just put that money secretly even if you're embarrassed and this lady never put that money it was after that incident she said she said she started to develop sicknesses and illnesses until it grew into cancer in that moment sitting in the service having a vivid picture of how she ruined somebody's life she said God I am so sorry I'm gonna take this money exactly same amount I don't know that lady no more but I'm gonna find a anybody right now and I will just give it to them as a sign of my repentance the moment she made a decision she felt exactly cold sensation that David was talking about walked out of a service didn't think anything of it was just repenting of her sin goes back to another next doctor appointment and her cancer was completely gone you can take a seat can somebody say amen I want all of us to understand God wants us to stop stealing God wants us to go away from greed and go into generosity and then he will bless us in Jesus name could you put the last verse give and it will be given to you good measure pressed down shaken together running over will be poured into your bosom and with the same measure that you use it will be measured back to you the last thing that I want to just remind you with is this is that we have to have a good vision of our finances we have to put God first in our finances and lastly is that we have to stay away from greed which is lying or being dishonest or stealing from people and we have to reflect God in being generous